Australia is the world's second driest continent after Antarctica. The big changes to our geology occurred with the opening of the deep Tasman Sea to our east between 85 and 55 million years ago and a rapid separation between Australia and Antarctica after that. Australia moved north into the dry latitudes forming deserts. Antarctica sat on the South Pole and accumulated a thick ice cap. During the Pleistocene epoch, starting 2.5 million years ago, the world's climate cooled dramatically. Roaring winds blew away much of our finer topsoil, leaving desert and coastal sand dunes. Our extensive rainforests and giant animals disappeared. Now it is an eroded continent with scarce fresh water, thin infertile soils, low mountain ranges and rivers that run inland picking up salt. Many farmers rely on artesian wells. Our east coast erodes constantly and our shifting sand dunes migrate slowly north blown by the wind and pushed by our eastern Australian current. In her poem, My Country, the bush poet Dorothea McKellar spoke of a sunburnt country with her beauty and her terror. The terrors may well intensify. They are violent storms, flood, fire and drought. Since the 1970s, scientists have been drilling ice cores several kilometres down to the base of the Antarctic and Greenland ice caps. The cores exhibit annual layers which can be dated using dust, trap gases and heavy and light isotopes in the water. In cold periods, there is more oxygen-16 than the heavier oxygen-18. There is more dust and less carbon dioxide. The cores go back the last one-third of the Pleistocene epoch and record violent fluctuations in temperatures of about 10 degrees Celsius from peak to trough. The causes are still debated. The interglacial warm bits are yellow and the glacial bits are blue. Aboriginal people came to Aussie in the middle of the last blue bit when it was cold. Their stories speak of a sea level rise shown by the last yellow bit. We call it the Holocene Warm Epoch and it started 11,700 years ago. This graph shows that the world's sea level rose about 120 metres. Dr Alberto Albani advises the Italians as sea levels continue to rise in the Venice Lagoon. He has worked for over 40 years mapping our ancient submarine river channels and the loose sedimentary layers on top by bouncing shock waves off them and recording the echoes. All our coastal rivers and estuaries are drowned river valleys. The old coastline was six kilometres east Sydney Harbour was a narrow, V-shaped valley. Now it is wider and much shallower. The last change in sea level was a drop of 1 to 2 metres, exposing rock platforms such as this one at Colcliffe, south of Sydney. This picture, taken from the Hargraves lookout, shows the view with Wollongong in the distance. We will focus on the second headland down. At sea level is the Bull Eye Coal Seam, first discovered by Bass and Flinders. You can see it as a dark layer. In the 1970s, it was possible to take excursions down to the mine entrance. That is not the case today. The narrow bean rocks above are soft and crumble in the wet. A small recent landslide happened as I took this picture. 
the old coast road had to be closed. The Sea Cliff Bridge cost $52 million and was opened in 2005. The sea is still battering these rocks and further defensive work is scheduled. Eventually, the sea will win. The storms of 2016 were very destructive of sand on the Wollongong beaches. Some sand will return in summer, but you will be a fool if you build on the waterfront. This picture by Kozlenko shows the Shire beaches ending in Kurnell Headland. 20,000 years ago, the Georges and Cooks rivers cut deeply through the Wander area and flowed left to the old coastline. As the sea level rose, Pleistocene and Holocene sands were blown into high dunes, which at Wander have been mined away. The worst winter storms form when intense lows cause sea levels to rise. If combined with moon-related king tides and fierce winds from the northeast, the coast can be battered with waves up to 13 metres high. This old picture shows a South Cronulla beach after 1930 with plenty of sand. Since then, there has been high-rise building on the headland north with walls and a new pavilion at the camera end. In 2013, a nasty storm reached these new dressing sheds. I went around the next headland to find massive sand loss at North Cronulla. The engineering geologists moved in. They built a metal fence to stop further sand loss, followed by a low wall and hexagonal sloping blocks to prevent wave reflection. Cape Banks at Kernel is a public reserve of high Hawkesbury sandstone cliffs, heavily jointed by past earth movements and prone to collapse. Here a drilling platform digs an inlet tunnel for the new desalination plant. In December 2015, a tornado with winds over 200 kilometres per hour hit Kernel, destroying dozens of homes and the roof of the desal plant. In 2016, another storm hit. Very little sand is left in South Cronulla. The headland seawall has driven the sand away and the walkway damaged. North Cronulla has also lost much sand, but the well-designed barrier has done its job. To the north of Botany Bay, this used to be Coogee Beach. See the surf club on the left? The sea smashed it in. Iconic Bondi Beach became a washing machine. The headland walkway was smashed in two places. And unfortunately a young man drowned in this area when taken by the boiling surf. North of the harbour, Manly Beach has been in the wars as well. In 2013, the Corso reflected the waves exposing basalt boulders. In 2016, the winds were frightening and seas surged across the Corso and threatened the pines. Damage to the Collaroy homes and beachfront have been well documented by the media, proving once again that you should not build on sand dunes. This graphic shows the Newcastle Port Stephens area with bedrock as shown in purple. The rest are loose coastal Pleistocene and recent sediments. The Hunter River sits on an active complex fault zone that has produced five earthquakes since settlement of magnitude over five. The last in 1989, magnitude 5.6, killed 11, injured 160 and damaged 40,000 buildings. Future construction of high-rise needs to be carefully monitored. The orange sections are Pleistocene dunes, a source of underground water at Tomago. At the entrance to the Hunter River lies Nobby's headland, which was an island. 
The top was reduced to build a break wall and lighthouse in the 1850s, creating a beach via longshore sand drift. I learnt to swim and surf here in the 1950s. Windstorms are a problem. In 1869, the schooner Messenger was caught carrying my wife's great-great-grandfather, Richard Russell, leaving his pioneer wife and six children to farm Burraduck Cattle Station near Bungwall on the north coast. There have been larger prey. The Sigma on Stockton Bight in 1974 and Pasha Balka on Nobby's Beach in 2007. Apart from the econocrats allowing Newcastle's heavy industry to close, the Hunter and North Coast region is experiencing increasingly violent climate swings. The Hunter has flooded 200 times since settlement, with 15 of them being quite nasty. The 1955 Maitland flood killed 25. My wife on the left is part of a family of talented globe-trotting research scientists. In the 60s, they moved to the floodplain at Millers Forest and lived in the schoolhouse. This is a mild flood. Newcastle has a water problem and was acute following the 55 flood. The response was the Balakira Canal and Grahamstown Dam next to the dunes. During drought, there are the bushfires in summer. There are evacuations for floods and for fires and lots of blackouts not helped by the sacking of linesmen. In 1958, my wife looks across to Miles Island, named after her ancestor. The Mile Lakes consists of some rocky headlands. The largest is Cape Hawk on the left and this is the view from the top. The rocks are Devonian in age, dip steeply and the layers are broken by faults. In between the headlands are beaches such as Boomerang Beach to the south, protected by retreating sand dunes. Seven Mile Beach from Booty Booty consists of Holocene sands that have migrated from south to north, separating the lakes from the sea. In the 60s and 70s, the sand miners worked the dunes from Hawke's Nest, Seven Mile Beach, Elizabeth Beach and even around Nabiak. Vegetation was destroyed and revegetation introduced weeds such as bitu bush and lantana. The area experiences frequent fires. This is popular One Mile Beach in 1965. After this, the council allowed houses to be built on the dunes. The storms of 2013 are a portent of events to come. You can see the high dune at the end of the beach. The black is mineral rutile. Foster Beach is man-made. Around 1900, rock was quarried at Bennett's Head and brought by steam train that picked up water from the tanks to build the break wall at the entrance to the Willamba River. By 1959, the sand had built up and the surf shed was on the north end. The council allowed high rise and a wall to be built on the dunes. Notice that little vegetation is present on the Tun Curry side. To their credit, volunteers have replanted the Tun Curry dunes and even the Foster dunes. But the storms of 2013 have cut back both these beaches and extra sand will be needed.